All right, again, happy Friday, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, you've all done this before, so let's get started. Short period of bell meditation. I'll give you a moment, get into a nice meditation posture, and we'll begin at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teaching. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the talk. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good. Do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. Excellent. All right, so since it is Valentine's Day, at least here in the U.S. and other countries, I now know it's called Friendship Day or Friend Day. I like that. Uh, so today we're going to talk about loving kindness, but we're also going to talk about love, and we're going to talk about compassion. Um, you know, it's another one of these interconnected, uh, interdependent kind of things that we talk about a lot. So the ideals of compassion, loving-kindness, and love, 
are, are found throughout the Buddhist Mahayana traditions, and they arise from the same emotional pool, but they manifest, manifest themselves differently depending on culture and context. Uh, living and practicing as an American Buddhist, for example, I found that loving kindness and love, they often get presented as the same thing. They get presented synonymously. But in fact, when we look at them, right, and we get a more appropriate view, uh, we see that they describe very different ways of responding both to suffering and to emotional attachment. And of course, to our emotional, right, our emotions too. Hey, Chris, glad you made it. Compassion is something that must be developed. It gets developed into an all-inclusive emotional phenomena that's directed towards sentient beings that are experiencing suffering. Loving kindness, with its foundation in compassion, is more encompassing of those components of existence that don't feel suffering, but whose well-being is directly tied to human flourishing. For example, the planet Earth, this great place we get to live. It, it, of course, it's not a living being, the planet Earth, but it does suffer in clear and recognizable ways that can benefit from us treating it with loving kindness. Then there's love. Love in its aspect as the most powerful human emotion. But it may not always include compassion, and it may not always include loving kindness as part of its experience, the romantic love experience. It can be described as an emotional attachment, for example, to a member of a tribe. So the practice of the three ideals, compassion, loving kindness, and love, they are a path to selflessness. When we begin to look at, at others through the lens of compassion or loving kindness or love, we are most likely going to find ourselves on the path of selflessness depending on how we treat ourselves and others, and the planet, and some other stuff you'll see. Now, you've likely heard a lot about loving kindness. Um, I think it's one of the great things that's, that the Tibetan tradition has brought forward for us, is this idea of loving kindness. It's very valuable in our day-to-day -day practice as Buddhists. Basically, if somebody said, what is loving kindness? Describe it for me. You will often hear it described as caring about others as if they were children you wanted to protect. So caring for others like they were your own children. With that mindset. But think of the selfless acts that parents do to protect or to provide for their children. Your parents may have done it for you. You may be a parent doing it for someone else. The basis of loving kindness arises with the recognition that all people and the earth and even material goods that promote human flourishing are deserving of actions that protect and strengthen them. They deserve to be treated with loving kindness. So out of the three, compassion, loving kindness, and love, loving kindness is the only one that we can pragmatically look at as a as a way to treat our material goods, that non-living stuff that we deal with on a daily basis. Acts of loving kindness, they kind of are acts of compassion, but they don't always arise from compassion, uh, as in the case of material phenomena, for example. So compassion, with its accepted emotional element, and compassion does have an element of emotion, this is reserved for living beings. We reserve compassion to offer to living beings. In engagements with people, for example, compassion should always be a factor. It must be a spontaneous result whenever we're dealing with people. That spontaneous result being loving kindness. Loving kindness is shown by some really simple things, like just being respectful and being sincere, sincerely caring about the current state, whatever it may be of the person that you're talking to, and then offering assistance whenever there is an opportunity to improve their lives. It doesn't matter whether they're a part of your tribe or not, they get treated with positive equanimity. 
meaning if they're part of your tribe or not, you treat them the same way, where, where loving kindness is concerned. The earth, this beautiful ball of dirt, water, fire, it doesn't emote, so technically there is no empathetic connection that leads to compassion for it. Yet, I, for one, still respond with loving kindness. Uh, when I encounter ecological or environmental plights of the planet, this planet that's my home, then I do strive to do what I can to limit any damage that I myself or others might do. This is treating the planet with loving kindness. You know, good example. If you're a backpacker or a hiker, you've heard of this idea called leave no trace, L-N-T. This means when you're outdoors, and it doesn't matter if you're in a wilderness or in a city park or canoeing down a river, you should always strive to leave no trace that you were there. Another thing you'll hear is leave only footprints is another uh, way to look at it. For, so when you're walking along, carry an extra trash bag, uh, gather up, your, of course, your own trash, but if you see something somebody else mindlessly left behind, pick it up too. And for the planet, you know, we can also show it loving kindness by recycling or minimizing our carbon footprint. And as Sophie said, leave the place better than you found it. If you can, absolutely. Now, you guys know, or most of you know, I don't live in a temple. I live in a house. I got my lady. We've been together for quite a while. So I've got material goods. You have to, right? These are the things, though, that add to the quality of life for myself and my family. For example, most of us have a car, right? It's a car that gets us where we need and want to go. So we need to care about the car's condition, and we need to care about the integrity of the car. Why? Well, because that car adds to our human flourishing. It adds to our happiness and our harmony and our health. Loving kindness is practiced by keeping the cars clean, uh, service it so it's mechanically sound, so it lasts a long time. It doesn't break down on you somewhere, because that's certainly a cause of suffering. And, and by the way, there's a, another way of showing loving kindness to the earth when you're talking about a car, and that's your emissions and that kind of thing. Then you got your house. Now, like I said, I live in a house, and I believe from experience, too, that temple monks feel the same way about their temples, that we care about our house. And we care for it because it contributes to our family welfare. So we treat it with loving kindness. Every living being deserves compassion, and every living being deserves being treated with loving kindness. Non-living things that contribute to personal or societal flourishing should at least be treated with loving kindness. So maybe this is a new way to look at loving kindness for you. Maybe the next time you sit down in meta meditation, for example, maybe you won't think about a living being. Maybe you'll actually think about a car you had or you still have. Now, there are some Buddhist books that I think incorrectly present the ideal of love with compassion and loving kindness all synonymously. They kind of use the words and replace them back and forth. Now, I agree. The emotional phenomenon of love certainly arises from the same emotional pool that has aspects that separate it from the other two, from loving kindness and compassion. They all kind of arise from this same emotional beginning. The empathy for the suffering of others that brings about compassionate thought and action, and then going on and acting with loving kindness or caring, can be developed or strengthened through our Buddhist practice. Neither requires the complex experience of love to be present. We can act with compassion, we can act with loving kindness, but there doesn't need to be romantic love present. To experience love, one does not have to feel compassion or show loving kindness. Engaging in an honest appraisal of some dysfunctional loving relationships that include violence and deceit will reveal that love endures without compassion and kindness. You may know someone that's in a relationship that they say, I love the person, but they're a jackass. 
for whatever reason. Well, there's not much love and kindness there, right? There certainly is not any compassion, but there's romantic love. Now, in my experience, compassion, love, and kindness will rarely lead to the unnatural attachments that can result in psycho-emotional suffering that love can bring to us if one is not mindful. Meaning things we have loving kindness or compassion toward, we are less likely to become attached and cling to them than we do something that we have that emotional love connection with. This is not at all to say that love is a bad thing, by the way. That's a great thing. But, as a Buddhist, can you really be expected to love everyone? Isn't this an unrealistic expectation? Because love, man, it's a complex experience, and it arises out of kinship or out of deep personal ties, or it arises from sexual desires, and it is experienced in wildly and widely different ways for everybody, for each person. Now, while I agree, I am connected to all things through the causal process of the universe. But I'd be lying if I said I love everyone, because I don't. I have compassion for all living beings, and I try my hardest to act with loving kindness toward all living beings. But when it comes to that powerful emotional experience of love, well, I'm going to choose to use that for members of my tribe, those you know, friends and family that are closest. My tribe consists of people and other beings who I've developed a deep emotional connection with, and this would be the same for you. It's going to be family, it's going to be friends, it's going to be the Sangha, it may be some others. Because it is with them that we develop the complex experience of love that arises from our complex relationships. Now, you might be saying right now maybe something to the effect of, well, that sure isn't how I view love. And that shouldn't be a surprise, because we each experience the emotion of love differently. That is important in any discussion about this particular emotional phenomenon, because while compassion is evidenced by acts of charity and acts of kindness, that is not always how love is expressed. You know, there are examples, we, we can talk about things like tough love, or I punish out of love. Loving kindness, too, is evidenced by acts of caring that aren't always part of everyone's expressions of love. There can be a husband and wife that say every day, I love you, I love you, but that's as far as it ever goes. There's no loving kindness connection. There's no, let me help you with that, or do you need something, or you know, just these little generalities that really show our loving kindness to another person or being. And we know the emotion of love can be the catalyst or the cause of a lot of suffering, both personal and societal. Love dies, and it can result in hatred and anger and despair and depression and vengeance and all that kind of stuff. Love of country and flag, these can result in war. Love of money can bring about greed and theft and lying and envy. Love of a whole host of things can bring about murder. Guilt can arise because the book or the religious leader says, we must love everyone, but we don't feel that way. We, we don't feel it. So am I saying we shouldn't love? Absolutely not. Love can be an experience that adds richness and beauty to our life and the lives of others. Love of family and friends, man, they empower us. So we should embrace it. Whenever, we, whenever it arises, embrace it and nurture it. So in my own experience, I realized every single moment that as I learned to be ever more compassionate 
to empathize and sympathize with the suffering and joy of others, I become more connected. And this has empowered me to do more good for myself and for others, to be more effective as an agent of wholesome transformation. Practicing loving kindness has helped me as a, as a Buddhist develop a more encompassing generosity of spirit, meaning I'm more likely to offer it more widely than I have you know, in the past. Uh, it's helping develop a stronger moral character, which is something we're shooting for, and an acceptance of how I am and how I can change. But also, how the world is and how I can interact positively with it. It's what happens when we look at compassion and love and kindness and love. In Buddhist practice, compassion and wisdom are critical components of the actions of a bodhisattva in training. Whether you choose to call it compassionate wisdom or wise compassion, it is the skillful means in which the bodhisattva in training takes the actions that are needed in order to alleviate suffering and guide others on the path. So, compassion, love and kindness, and love. There's differences. But like I said, they're still interconnected. They're still interdependent on one another. But it's something that we, we, uh, we need to realize, again, that loving kindness doesn't always have to apply to something that's a lot. Now, I want to do one other thing today. This is kind of in honor of Valentine's Day's Day and people's relationship, be it, be it family, friend, lover, whatever. Uh, this is kind of directed toward partners, but you can use it for other th uh, other folks too with a little skillful redescription. Let me hand something out here. Some of you may already have this from a while back. Let's see. All right, what I've handed you is something called prana relationships. And what this is, this is a uh, something to try. Try with your relationship. doesn't matter if it's how long it's been going on. It doesn't matter if it's already a wonderful relationship or maybe it needs some work. But I just want to offer this to you. Now, and I will tell you, this works, by the way. Uh, this is something Mary and I have done for years and years, and it's just become second nature. It's spontaneous to us now. So, the idea is, in the beginning, love is there, you know, it's fantastic, heart beating, sweating a little bit, heart palpitations, you know, hearts a flutter, your breathing is shallow and rapid, and your skin is tingling a little bit. But after that comes the relationship, and that takes effort. There, it is said through research that seven months in a monogamous relationship we, did, we begin to develop that sense of deep connection and intimacy. So you've begun to rely on sharing with each other. Seven months, this is not a long time. But in the terms of psycho-emotional attachment, it is a big thing. Because at around seven months, that's when you really start feeling that attachment. And that's a good thing. It's a positive thing. You come to rely on your partner being there for you and you for them. So there's someone to share with. This is something worth effort. It's worth commitment. You'll want to be proactive as a partner. You'll want to do things that strengthen the bond, that engage in activities that bring about positive development of your relationship. While you know that over time the dynamics of relationships will change, you can keep them on a path of at least wholesome transformation as much as you can. That's all we can do with anybody. So prana, P-R-A-N-A, -A, is a Dharma technology, if you will. And this is prana not to be confused with prajna. Prajna means wisdom. Uh, prana, uh, this is about our interconnection between our life force and the causal universe. It's kind of like chi or ki. Now there are typical complaints when it comes to relationships. He or she doesn't listen. Uh, he or she has lost interest. He or she doesn't appreciate me. 
uh, he or she isn't affectionate, uh, he or she doesn't help around the house. So this idea of prana, this is a proactive approach that touches on these issues and offers ways that not only can you avoid those issues, but you can start using those issues to build a stronger relationship. And by the way, a more fun relationship. It's all about the fun. So I want to run through these. And, and again, I have to say, Mary and I have been doing these for years. And once you start doing them, you really start enjoying them. And they just, like I say, they become spontaneous. So the first one is P, partings. Before you say goodbye to each other for the day, just take two minutes, two minutes, and ask, what is one thing you plan to do today? So, like, somebody off to work, you say, oh, well, what's something going on at work today that you're either looking forward to or not? And then they ask you, oh, well, while I'm gone today, what are you going to do? Two minutes. Two minutes. Next one is R, reunions. So at the end of each workday, sit down or stand or whatever and have a low-stress conversation. Take 20 minutes to talk about maybe some cool plans you've got for when you're not at work. Or talk about the garden, what you're going to do this year, if it's already growing, what you need to do. Maybe exchange some humorous or even heart-wrenching stories about your day. You know? But... Low stress, just chat. You know, have something to drink and just enjoy each other's company for 20 minutes. A, appreciation. Take five minutes and show genuine, sincere, boy, that, I can't stress that word enough, sincere appreciation for something your partner did for you. And this can be as simple as thank you for being you. After all, it that's the you you fell for in the first place. So again, sincere appreciation. Then comes N, novelty. One of my favorites. This is an opportunity to be creative. Arrange a weekly date. For two hours, find a comfortable, relaxed atmosphere. It could be in your own home. It might even be in your backyard. And just do something together. It can be a shared interest, or maybe learn about your partner's interest that you don't know much about, or maybe just sit quietly and enjoy each other's company. But do something together. Two hours. Weekly. Pretty good deal. And then the last one is another A, and that's affection. Just try a little tenderness. For five minutes, engage in some hand-holding, some nice kissing, some hugging, maybe even a little groping. Nothing wrong with some good groping. But do it with tenderness and do it with gentleness. And most of all, with loving kindness. Now, if you do the math here, all these different times, that's five hours you would spend a week. Five hours a week in an effort to keep a loving, committed relationship, keeping it creative, keeping it fun. So that's five hours of the pure practice of loving kindness. It's five hours that will have a lasting karmic effect on your relationship. It is definitely a win-win situation. And I'll say one more time, been doing it for years, guarantee if you put the effort in, it will work. Of course, I have to say, as long as, you know, both sides of the relationship are willing to give it a try. So there you go. Prana. Dharma technology.